welcome once again, GMI Hub, live online. Here we are, and we have an amazing show for you. Our contestants, or I should say our, <laughs> our panelists today, Emma Julian and Rebecca Webster have been with us before, and uh, Kathleen Jones is joining us today. And we're going to be talking about rights, royalties, and licensing, part two. So thank you for joining us. My name is Dale Borland. And I'm Cheryl Duick. I'm so glad you're able to join us today for part two of this conversation of rights, royalties, and, and licensing. You know what? The reason we're doing this is because many of you, after our last, uh, our last broadcast, had a lot of questions. You all said, great information, but break it down for us a little bit more. So these lovely ladies are here today, and they're going to help break it down for you. Um, we have Emma from ReSound. You may remember her from the last time that she was here. She is the industry, I want to say industry relations person for ReSound, and I'm probably saying that wrong, industry specialist. <laughs> Close? Come here. Industry partner specialist. I was close. <laughs> we also have Rebecca Webster back from the Canadian Musical Reproduction Rights Association. Did I say that right? <laughs> welcome, welcome back. And new to our panel, we have Catherine Jones, who uh, is from Connect Music Licensing. We want to welcome her. She's got 25 years of being in the licensing industry and um, she is a wealth of information and from what I've read about her she has been known for her kindness her openness and she's been so influential on with 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 artists helping them out in this area so welcome Catherine it's such an honor to have you all here <laughs> thank you that was a lovely introduction <laughs> so ladies um, well, this is kind of a repeat for Emma and Rebecca and a new question for Catherine, but we're going to start a little bit, like do a little bit of a review. Can we redefine again licensing? What is licensing, especially here in Canada, because in other countries it has a whole different meaning. So what is licensing here? Maybe we'll want Catherine. <laughs> sure. Yeah, sure. I can go. Um, so Basically, whenever there is a commercial use of a copyrighted sound recording, uh, a license is required. And that license can either be obtained directly from the owner of the, of the song, or it can be licensed through um, collective licensing, through an association such as Connect, uh, I'm pointing to the squares, ReSound, so can CMRA. And, and you know, blanket, blanket licensing uh, through these CMOs is the most efficient way of getting a license out. Um, so that's why the majority of, of tariffs are based on those types of licensing regimes. It's a one-stop shop for the for the customer, the you know the licensee to come to get one license that covers you know most, if not all. You know, there's some some. Um, I, I can't say that it's going to be 100% all the time, but for for the majority, you're you're going to go to one place to get the 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 license for the copyright in that particular area. But it's important to remember that. There's two different types of licenses and there's two different types of copyright. Ah, okay. Well, we're going to be talking about that. Um, Rebecca and Emma, do you have anything to add to what uh, Catherine had to say about licensing? Um, I was going to say that um, maybe if you don't, you aren't familiar with the term licensing, you might want to think of it as um, a sort of permission that you're, um, you're granting someone else. Um, so that's a really simplified way um, because the person who is a copyright owner so in my case if you're a songwriter um, you own that copyright of the song that you've written and if you are going to be uh, licensing it that's you're going to give permission for someone else to um, use it in some way okay excellent i guess yeah. also often uh, for artists the word licensing comes to mean sync licensing um, often it like, gets used as kind of a catch-all just about sync, um, which none of our organizations uh, have anything to do with. So sync licensing is uh, music being used in film and television, which often we get artists coming to us saying, hey, I'm looking for licensing, uh, and we can actually help them with that. And it's confusing to them because you know, we are called ReSound Music Licensing or Connect Music Licensing. Um, but what we're doing is 
we are providing the licenses to music users. Um, so just to clarify off the top, we're not talking about sync licensing today. <laughs> No, that's, that's a great point. And each of our organizations are member based. You sign up with us and you provide us with the mandate to manage your copyrights on your behalf for, for specific uses. Okay. So Catherine, you mentioned that the CM, the, the, there's a CMO that oversees, is this an organization? Sorry, CMO, know? you know, the music industry is, is alphabet soup. CMO stands for collective management organization. Okay. Um, so it just, it's just, a type we're, we're just a type of, of administrator really oh okay and, and, and the power of that word collective means that we can negotiate as a group on your behalf so we can go to spotify and negotiate a rate with them and obviously if you have a, a big membership then you've got more weight to negotiate with them that's awesome okay um now people responsible for getting the licensing Songwriters, I'm assuming it's songwriters, some results from a search. but there's also, um, I guess the end users, am I correct? It's either the people who make the song or the people who want to use the song. Those are the ones who are responsible for getting the licensing. Is that right? It's the user of the song. The user of the, the song. license. So that the, the, whoever is, whoever is exploiting the song gets the license from the owner of the song but the songwriter does need to re register their song with your organizations in order to allow, using Rebecca's terminology, permission for the song to be used, correct? They should. Yes. Yeah. Think about it, I like to think about it as, as um, say, a, a, a pie, and you can cut the pie down the, the middle, and you've got two pies. One pie is for reproduction rights, and one pie is for performance rights. When you cut your pie down the middle, you are covering both copyrights. So the copyright in the written song or the, the musical work and the copyright in the sound recording, which is the song itself. So when you look at your reproduction pie, you need two licenses. So you need a license. I sorry, I use my hands a lot. That's okay. Um, especially with this pie theory. Uh, so the reproduction for the musical work is licensed through the CMRA who Rebecca works with. And the, um, the license for the sound recording for reproduction goes through Connect, goes through our organization. Now, when you jump over to the performance pie, again, it's split. So scales, what happens on one side happens on the other, basically. Um, for the musical work, you get the performance license through SOCAN. And for the sound recording, you get the license through ReSound, where Emma works. Okay, so now you've just answered my other question, which was, why would why would uh, um, songwriters register which each with each organization? And you just clarified it. Recognize the pies, everyone. <laughs> That's right. So I, I did actually go ahead and post a link to um, a chart, an infographic on our website that explains and gives you a little bit of a roadmap as to who the CMOs are, who you sign up with, when, why, um, and a bit more information about what royalties you can you can expect to receive from different types of service providers, whether it's a Spotify or radio or background music supplier. Awesome, thank you. I'm hoping that the person managing our chat will be able to copy paste that in the chat for everyone. Um, so other questions, um, I'm gonna do scenarios. With COVID that has come, I'm sure that licensing, the, the whole industry of licensing has had its little, um, everything's been affected. So I want to I want to bring some scenarios to your to you and ask what licensing would be involved and maybe why. So an example would be there are artists now that are that are um, finding ways to do quote unquote live performances. Originally they would just you know stand in their living room and play a song on say YouTube or on Facebook. Um, now they're finding ways with restaurants and other organized other locations opening up to to go to those places to still stand in say their restaurant even though the people aren't in the restaurant but they're somehow streaming that performance to the people on the patio or the people in the drive-in or something like that so I'm kind of curious what licenses are are active for that kind of a scenario or is it anything new from what would 
normally be existing. Rebecca, you want to go first or do you want me to? Well, uh, okay. So um, first of all, uh, one of the words that you used was performance. So um, right away that di dictates what part of the pie, as we, we, we talked about before, was, um, was implicated. So there's um, SOCAN, uh, which is an organization who is a performing rights organization. So often you hear PRO, and that's what it stands for. Um, they license the performance and they license venues. And what they've been doing of late is to license the, um, if, it's, if it's a location, sure, but they also sometimes um, license a virtual venue. From my point of view though, I, because I'm the Canadian Musical Reproduction Rights Agency, so that's CMRRA, we are talking about the reproduction of songs on two platforms. Um, currently, the, the situation for live streams um, in the reproduction area for my particular uh, right is um, licensed in Canada for Facebook, Instagram, and Oculus VR. All other platforms are currently un unlicensed. So what we are suggesting to people is that they keep a set list and um, for instance, we've had a lot of festival promoters talk about this when they say they're doing um, a friend of mine, Baja Bulat, she did a, a show on a stage the other day in Ottawa. And there was, it was in front of cars. It was a drive-in theater performance. And um, so for festival promoters, we're saying um, for that live stream, keep your set list. And when that platform is um, licensed, that we will um, come back to you and figure that out with you. Um, but if you want to keep within um, the licensed platforms in Canada, Facebook, Instagram, and Oculus VR are the ones to go with. You can add to that. There's so much more to talk about. But, um, <laughs> that, but, but that's, that's, a, that's a great overview. Um, I mean, that's the landscape right now. Um, and what, when, when Rebecca means licensed, she means licensed on a blanket basis. Mm -hmm. right? So you no need to do anything. Um, yeah. From the sound recording side of that, no license is required if you're performing live because you're creating the sound recording. You're not reproducing an existing sound recording. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. So when everyone was doing their performance, so this, this is to clarify my understanding. So when people were originally standing in their living rooms, for example, and, and playing their song for Facebook or YouTube, that would have been a performance license on uh, well i guess well usually at say you're doing that in a venue um usually you send in a set list to socan and that that gets qualified as they they have an algorithm that figures out how much they pay out for that mm -hmm. but um but you would be doing the same thing in this in this case for socan sending in your set list mm -hmm. um you know, you don't have to do that with Facebook and Instagram currently for the Canadian territory because we've already put in place a, a license and um, that's for general entertainment. So um, if you are making money off of it um, beyond what is considered user generated content, then that might be a different scenario. Um, and also this might explain some things that you might have noticed, like um, if you were on the platform Twitch and there were DJ sets that were getting dropouts, um, that's because there were copyright claims coming at the platform and um, they were saying you can't use the Prince song, <laughs> you know, like oh. in this live set because it's not licensed. Um, so what I've heard from our legal team is that it's an area that they're they're catching up on, except for this takes a long time to have all parties agree on these type of things. Because what we're talking about is the value of these copyrights, and um, you know, it, it's it's not just performing live. It's uh, there's there's copyrights indicated. Speaking of copyrights, I I think we asked this question the last time, but the proper way to copyright if they're registering with you that's not a copyright correct 
registered registering for a license registering their music is not copywriting their music i just wanted to clarify that because i think some people thought that was the same thing no i think we answered this question um previously where where if you've written the song the the copyright exists yeah um, and 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 if you're just registering them you're basically registering into our database into our library right and that applies to everyone everyone has a database in this group of collectives and um it's how we manage how to pay you it's, it's actually easier to prove um ownership or copyright now in the digital world because there's a digital footprint whether it's the writing of the lyrics the recording the the um the production of the song there's there's a you know there's a digital a digital footprint that you can prove and say look i created this on such and such a date yeah. as opposed to the old days when you used to have to mail yourself a copy yes <laughs> i remember those days hey thank you yeah. for clearing that up i think we could still talk a bit further but i just wanted to remind everyone who's just joining us now we are talking to three great panelists emma julian rebecca webster and katherine jones now emma julian is from resound and Rebecca Webster is from the CMRA, and Kathleen Jones is from Connect. And we're talking today about rights, royalties, and licenses. And now you may think to yourself, we've done this topic before, but it's so much to talk about, we had to do it again. So we're so glad that you've joined us. And, and at this point, I'd like to just to invite you to share this with other people. If you know people that might be interested in finding more about this, maybe they're into music themselves or they're an artist themselves, just share the experience. Let people know about this, and uh, it'd be great for us to be able to connect with them and you as well. And don't forget, we're gonna upload this onto our YouTube channel uh, later on in the week. So it'll be there for you as a resource anytime you need at GMI Hub online. Thank you, Dale. Um, I do have, it looks like I have one question that's come from the audience. They want to know what sign up means. What does sign up mean? Is that uh, with related, related to the, again, signing your you, music up or something else? You, you register with each of the organizations who you would like to represent your recordings um, and your copyright so that you can collect the royalties and the revenue that they receive from the licensees. If you don't register with all the available uh, organizations, you may be leaving money on the table. Okay. Sign up is, for, you know, sign up slash membership is free for all of these organizations. That was the next and, one. What does it cost? <laughs> yeah, it, it, Free. And the reason we say sign up is, I'm, I'm just going to speak from my experience from, from CMRA's point of view, we have a legal document that says you want to sign up for these lines of business. So, for instance, you want to sign up to collect all of the money that you've generated from online streaming platforms. And we license all the online streaming platforms in Canada for this reproduction right. So, say you had something that you just Put up on on soundcloud and it's your own song um, that is something that we would collect for um, we also have other lines of business we have uh, youtube facebook these kind of things and you it's like a tapas menu you would sign up for each um each uh line of business as as needed um and the reason it's a legal agreement is because we're talking about a lot of money um so um, we need Would you to... say it's important to sign up every song and um, submit every set list? Um, you would sign, I mean, I think you can be strategic. Um, I think every organization has a way of processing information. But say you had a big hit song um, and you haven't signed up for your reproduction right in Canada to collect it and to receive that money then I would start with that one. Um, but there's two steps. First, you, you sign the legal agreement for what you want us to collect on your behalf. And then um, this, the next step is registering. So you almost asked a question, but. <laughs> Very good. Awesome. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the, the questions that are popping up and I guess someone wanted to confirm, do you sign up with all three? And I'm tempted to say, yes. <laughs> Ladies, do you agree? <laughs> Am I learning? Am I doing good? Yes, you're learning. <laughs> if, you, if you are the owner of all your copyrights, then absolutely. And don't forget about SOCAN. They're not in the room, but mm -hmm. um, you know they're important as well. And I should mention, um, I don't know if that, that 
uh, link went up into the chat because I can't see the chat right now. But um, if it yeah, hasn't, it is up. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just want to remind everyone that there, that document, that that link actually is a diagram. I, um, and thank you, Catherine, for providing it. It's a diagram that actually takes you through a step-by-step -step process, asking certain questions and, and basically saying if, if it's, you know, ask a question. If your answer is yes, you go in this direction. If it's no, then go in this direction. Um, so definitely follow that map, you know, follow the yellow brick road, so to speak, of that to, to help with answering some of those questions. Um, more questions are coming up here. Um, if we have an album of covers recorded and videos to accompany the... Um, that would be one of my questions, too. Well, that would be one of your questions? <laughs> yeah, keep going. So if we have an album of covers recorded and videos to accompany them um, and they're posted to YouTube, do we send our info to Connect uh, Music and the CMRA? So basically, where do we send it? <laughs> you, you actually don't send information anywhere. It's though the, the, the platforms that I'm going to speak very broadly for a second, the platforms or the commercial or the user of the music provides us with logs that we process and then pay out. What your job is to do is to make sure that you provide your repertoire or your catalog. Um, you know, Rebecca was talking about registering your songs. It's the same thing. You've got to tell us what you own so that when those logs come in from the users, we can match them to you and then pay you. Otherwise, the, the, you know, we need, to, we need a way to connect the dots. Yes. So, yeah. Um, in terms of covers, um, from my perspective, because I deal with music publishers, and so those music publishers... Um, are the ones who represent rosters of songwriters. And uh, sometimes if you don't have a music publisher representing yourself, you then by default are your own music publisher. Um, so I assume in this audience, we have a lot of self-published songwriters um, watching us today. So if you were doing um, an album of, of other people's songs, then you're not registering those songs with CMRA because you don't own that because you didn't write those songs. Um, there is one part that you need to know. Um, if you are producing um, physical copies of the, the, these albums in some way, on some kind of, it could be a USB drive, it could be vinyl, it could, it could be CD. Um, if you are pressing copies in some way, then you do need to come to CMRA to apply for a license to have that song on your physical product. And um, that's, that's called mechanical license. And our department is called pay as you press. Um, so that's a consideration. That brings up a good point because I'm going back to the days where people used to do, um, parody type songs. So there's one song, I know there's a song uh, that was called Beat It and another Weird Al or something that made the song Eat It, you know. So I, I look at that kind of scenario and I'm sure there are people that do songs like that. I, I know there are people in the industry that do songs like that today with other songs, not just Beat It, but you know, with other songs like that. So I, I the question I have with that is how does, how would that work? Now, because it's a parody, um, the, the originality would be in the actual, maybe the lyrics of the song, but the tune, it belongs to someone else. So uh, is there, how does that work in terms of, I guess, licensing? Do they register that song? Do they register the lyrics and not the tune? How does that work? If you were Weird Al, you would register that song, but that copyright might not be owned entirely by Weird Al because of the this acknowledgement that you know that this song is based on another song and that's what's making it successful. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you've actually identified one part of the musical work definition where there's the composition and there's the lyric. Um, and those are two separate copyrights. 
Um, I don't know. I've never been asked about Weird Al before, but if if you, I'd love to see the breakdown of that, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so, I understand the Canadian and the American have different um, different loyalties or um, problematics because of that. Because Apologetics is one of the groups that uh, I'm, I'm friends with, and they do a lot of parody, and they're, they're American, and they have to do certain things to make it legal for them to do so. For Canada, I believe it's different, and I'm not even sure what that means. Yeah. Huh. Uh, I don't know. Catherine, do you know? <laughs> well, I'm never, because I'm, I've always been on the, you know, more the label side, I've never dealt with, with uh, parody, but I would liken it, I would think, to a sample. Yeah. So where you've used a piece of somebody else's song in your song, and how that works is a, a direct negotiation with the owner of the of the original song so that you could use it in what you know your song your new song yeah um so just like registration the ownership uh sorry not registration but with the composition the ownership may not be held 100 percent by you but depending on the the arrangement that you made with the the owner of the original recording you may have to split it 50 percent 90 10 whatever ah uh, okay so i would presume it's similar Weird Al would be getting the the compensation for the performance because there's no doubt that sure he's a performer so yeah. that implicates a different right but you can see that he would get um, be able to collect royalties for the performance it's just that on the songwriting side that reproduction that would be a negotiation yeah right so on a sample you would you would be able to collect on the on the reproduction and the performance and on the the um, <laughs> this is so complicated. <laughs> on, a, on a parody, yes. <laughs> oh. on a parody, you would only collect on the the, um, the recording and not on your side. <laughs> I, I also have a sneaking suspicion. I, I mean, it's been almost fifteen years since I was in college learning about all of this, but I have a feeling that parody might fall under fair use, and so there's also a chance that in Canada maybe. So it's just there yeah. there is that complication but that's not commer for commercial use mm -hmm. so weird al we know he's super commercial so i feel yeah. like yeah <laughs> yeah there's there, there's definitely a negotiation going on i mean yeah. you there you know just just any kind of usage of any sample is is a direct negotiation with a music publisher so yeah interesting okay it's so, clear as mud it's <laughs> yeah i think it's, it's complicated to the point of where somebody else might answer that question <laughs> well i asked because i know that there are people that do that they they actually take a song that's already famous i mean dill we can go back to uh, an exercise that we were told to help people yep. learn to write songs and some people don't take it all the way through they they they're told Find a song that you think is uh, that appeals to you that is a hit. Now take that song and change the words. And sometimes they just stop there and go, okay, I want to publicize it. Whereas the next step after that would be now try and change the tune. Now try and, you know, and, and change the background and, or something like that. Yeah. And, it's and then you take the change the melody to your melody, but then you take the music and change it to what melody you've created. So you're ending up recreating the same style with different chord progressions right when they go through the whole process then it's a brand new song and then and that's where all what we've been talking about taking that brand new song and registering it makes sense but then if they stop part way which is a parody it's interesting to see it just was curious to see what would happen with that um, another question that has popped up um what is the turnaround time for licensing like not licensing i'm um, receiving um, I guess the royalties from, sorry, is, it's correct to say the royalties from all the licensing. Is that the right way to say that? Yep. That's okay. True. That's the correct term. So, so what is the turnaround in general time, time? <laughs> so uh, CMRA pays out four times a year, um, four quarters a year. And um, sometimes we actually have more than that. And we do sort of special installations of, of, of royalties that are coming out. Um, sometimes that's because of um, new platforms coming in. And, but 
yeah, we're regular, so four times a year. Um, it really depends on, say you register with us tomorrow, um, there is a defined time. We, it takes us uh, five to 10 business days to get your information into the system. And then at that point, they ask for um, all the registration information. And that actually takes quite a bit of time to um, put together and uh, get into our system. So it depends on the timing versus the quarters at, at um, how we pay out, but four times a year. Four times a year. How about with um, uh, Resound, Emma? Yeah, I mean, it also depends on timing. There are a lot of moving factors, moving parts. Um, if you are a member, one of the member organizations, such as Connect or say Actorox, MROC or RTC on the performer side, um, you know, Resend has to collect all the money, um, process the logs, and then send the money to the member organization who then passes it on to the member, um, to the artist member or master member. Um, so it could take, a long time. We do have to process all the logs um, at the resound part of this all happening. So that can depend on when we receive logs for certain tariffs. If you're earning uh, your royalties primarily from public performance or primarily from satellite radio or whatever, it depends. So um, it can take some time, but I think the general answer that we sometimes give on this is usually about a year uh, before so from the time that you s register something especially it depends like if it's getting airplay now or if it was a long time ago that kind of thing so it depends but generally about a year from the time that uh, you start the process to the time you might get a payment okay um Catherine with connect is yeah, there... we too <clears throat> excuse me we too pay out quarterly um there are uh, you know another consideration is to take into account what the licensing terms are and how often the licensee pays because the licensee could be paying on a monthly basis or a yearly basis or a quarterly basis so commercial radio for example um is paid out once a year it's not paid out on, on a quarterly basis whereas background music suppliers report and pay monthly so they could potentially be paid out within that quarter or the following quarter. So it, it's, <clears throat> it's different depending on the category of license. And there's always every effort to try and process and distribute as, as quickly as possible. Right, right, okay. I should mention too, um, I, I, I think it was last year, about eight months ago now, I met someone at a conference who had songs that were played on CBC radio and it had been about you know, since 2004, since they'd, they'd had this, this song played on the radio and they'd never collected their reproduction rights. And I was able to say, well, once you actually register with us, we can retroactively collect for the online streams only to day one of those streaming services. So that, that doesn't always happen. A lot of royalties kind of time out at, after a certain point for various reasons but um we were then going back to all of the services and invoicing them for all of those streams and plays and downloads so if you know, if, if a songwriter hasn't registered their song and yet it's been publicized and playing on streams or another locations if it was on online streaming services oh, no. okay so then, online then can retroactively do it and is there a limit to that retroactiveness or there's no, no limit? Well, when the launch of the streaming services, which is oh, okay. mm -hmm. about 2004 in Canada. Oh. Wow. <laughs> I know I have only learned that in the last year. So <laughs> wow. <laughs> Never had to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. At this time, I just want to welcome those who are watching. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Emma Julian is here from Resound. We got, uh, Rebecca Webster from CMRA, and we've got Catherine Jones from Connect. All of these ladies are going to be talking to them, the odd man out here. Um, they're talking about rights, royalties, and licenses. And this is uh, actually, if you remember, we did this a little while ago, a few weeks ago. And it's nice to be able to um, continue the conversation because there's so much there for us to look at. 
And so if you're enjoying what you're seeing, please share this and let other people uh, know what we're doing. Um, maybe you have a musician friend of yours or someone who's into music and wants to know about the rights royalties and licensing. And uh, tonight is a great night to be joining us to find out more about that and share the experience. Thank you. That's great. I love the questions that are coming on, everyone. Thank you so much for participating. And yeah, share it. Uh, this is not a private conversation. And bring in more questions. Um, question, I, I can't even number it right now. So I'll just, I'll just uh, <laughs> quote it. Um, okay, I think you've answered this um, based on the concept of sampling, but I'm going to reiterate it and you can let me know if if, if you've already answered this. Um, if someone wants to purchase an instrumental track and they want to write their own lyrics to it, um, do they need to have a mechanical license? Um, I'll just stop there. There's, a, there's more question to that, but do they need to have a mechanical license for that? Uh, I'm guessing, I'm gonna take a guess. Can I take a guess? Take a guess. Can I guess that it depends on if they're going to re, they're going to put it on a on a say a CD or anything like that? Is that when they need the mechanical? They license? need a license if they were reproducing the product on a like physical basis. Um, if they were then going to take that on, um, and put that on a digital platform, they'd have to establish um, who owns that new song. And um, that de is determined by how you purchase the um, backing track or whether it's, it, it's just like a one-time fee. Um, because it, in effect, by buying it, you've, there's got to be some kind of fine print that says how you're using it. Um, it let, like, gives you that... Um, permission to either use it maybe in a public performance or maybe like as soon as you get um, to the point where you could be making money off of something then it's determined by um, because you you obviously didn't create the whole song as a whole so it really depends on that first step of, of what was the negotiation when you purchased the, the back the backing track Okay. And then someone asked if there's a difference between, uh, oh, uh, is there a difference between gospel church music and non-gospel church music, I guess, when it comes to licensing? I think the reason, I, I think I know why that question is coming up, but I'll let you answer that. <laughs> I, I remember Kezia from SoCan, she answered this really well last time and i don't know enough about church music when it comes to um uh reproduction to answer okay. that accurately but i think there is some implication when it comes to the performance um, i'm not sure if the other two can comment on that one i imagine they're asking about public domain tracks versus non-public domain um, possibly possibly that, that's what I got from the question. I don't okay. know if you've got the same. Um, and it depends on, on the song. Mm. It depends on the composition. Okay. And, and I think last time, true. right, yeah. Last time what Kezia was saying, I think, is relating to performances in a church. So, like, licensing isn't required yeah. if it's part of a religious service. Right. Um, but in it's terms of concept. being, yeah. So that, so that answer pertains to like a church as a business, like do they have to get a license for, for the use of music in that service? But um, in terms of like reproduction or licensing, um, it, I guess it depends what they're using that song for <laughs> yeah. and what song it is. Yeah, it, for me, uh, my royalty always depends on who owns the song. That's where you start. And uh, once you've determined who owns the song, and it could be multiple um, songwriters, um, then you determine how that's compensated. I want to ask about Canadian content. Um, does that have any effect or any repercussions or impact on the licensing at all? 
Um, for CMRA, I can say that we work with copyright holders um, who are streaming, playing, and downloading songs in Canada, but that doesn't mean that they are based in Canada. So it doesn't matter. Um, we're, we're based on what's happening in our territory um, rather than where the copyright owner is based. Mm, okay. Catherine? I guess, I guess in theory, for Canadian rights holders who are earning uh, royalties through commercial radio, it would benefit them for Canadian content to be higher uh, because then there would be more opportunity for them to get radio play. Um, but that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, our licenses do not require um, a Canadian content um, percentage or guidelines. Mm. So we, we could potentially license an American business operating in Canada, but we um, that's not our job. Right. Right. When it talk, we're talking about the maple content, you know, the music, mm -hmm. the artist, the performance, and the lyrics. So those four things are what what um, what you're speaking to there. Okay, ladies, are you familiar with CCLI? Does that ring a bell to any of you? No, no, it doesn't ring a bell. Okay, because uh, someone had a question about how does CCLI fit into this, and even I have to think about that. <laughs> Well, first of all, what, what is CCLI? What does that stand for? I believe it's, it's a... Oh, okay. Hang on. I'm pulling it up. <laughs> okay. Christian, Christian Copyright Licensing International. There you go. Yes, that one. <laughs> so they provide information and resources for churches and copyright owners around the world relating to copyrights of Christian worship songs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it sounds like they are in themselves um, uh, a collective uh, organization that licenses on behalf of owner, copyright owners, but in the specific realm of, of Christian worship songs. Oh, okay. Sounds like they could answer that question from before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so then, the, so I guess, um, would CCLI, would that kind of an organization be your clients then? Is that, is that what I'm picking no, up? No, the only clients of um, CMRA are music publishers. So if they were a music publisher, then like of, of Christian based music or gospel mm -hmm. music, mm -hmm. then they could be our client for sure. Okay. Uh, but if they're just an organization who is also licensing um, and, and that means they're negotiating um, directly with the platforms and the radio stations or, you know, trying to negotiate tariffs with the Copyright Board of Canada, then they would be doing the work of a collective, just much like all of us. So I'd have to know a little bit more about. Yeah, I think it, it work. if I remember correctly, CCL, I've never personally had to deal with them, but I believe um, a lot of church organizations deal with CCLI if they want to take songs that are written and use them in their services. Um, and I think the churches have to register with CCLI to have the right to, to be able to sing certain songs with the, with the congregation. They're not making money off of it, I don't believe. Um, it's just the right to sing, the right to use the music. I think that's, that's basically what they do. So, sounds like um, licensing. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like licensing, yeah. <laughs> um, and that being said, in, when licensing, does, do you... When, when we're submitting or, or now, um, okay, I'm going to pretend I'm a songwriter. I have a song. I want to register my song. So what, walk me through the steps. What am I going to do when I come to you and say, I have my song. I want to license it. Do I just fill out a form? What information should I have ready? Um, you know, is it just my name, address, here's my song, and yay, it's done, <laughs> you know? Um, is it, is there more? Each organization requires different information. Um, okay. Each of us have different portals and platforms that you go to. Um, but basically it is, yes. Um, you know, copyright owner address, you know, contact information. Um, 
and then the name of the song, the name of the composition, the name of the writer or writers, an arranger, if there's any on the, the composition side, um, the name of the artist on the sound recording side, the ISRC code, the ISWC code. So, you know, each of us are, there's little nuances between each organization, but it's generally all the information to do with, with how to track and how to identify who owns the, the recording or the composition is, is what's required. Yeah, and you, as you get more and more into royalties, you'll 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 figure out that each song um, has all these different identifiers, and it's sort of like a, a fingerprint. Um, and you know, even if you have a partial print, it might match up with the system, um, because what in the end we're doing is we are taking that song, and then when the radio stations send in their their data of what was played or when the streaming service send in their data of what was streamed, um, that matches up with what we have in our library with what you've sent us. Um, so we're looking to try and match those two sides of the conversation. That makes sense. You've mentioned two codes, Catherine, the ISRC, and you mentioned another one real quickly. Can you, <laughs> I know there are some people that know exactly what those are, and then there are other people who don't. So for, so all of us can be on the same knowledge level. <laughs> can sure. you tell us what those are? <laughs> the ISRC, the ISRC yeah, is the, ISRC. sorry, Dale? Sorry, sound. Uh, that would be, that'd be Emma, right? We're talking about the ISRCs. Uh, actually, Connect manages the um, ISRC uh, allocation okay. in Canada. Okay, great. So ISRC is the uh, International Standard Recording Code. Oh. Uh, and it's, it's, it's like the song's name that includes all it's like the it's like if you think of yourself as a person your name is your is your code oh. um and every you know your dna is your metadata it's it's a similar type of concept and the other one i mentioned is the iswc which is the international standard work code which relates to the composition oh wow see i didn't know about that other one <laughs> um with that does does one need to submit their lyrics for any of those codes? Is the, the, are the lyrics related to any of those codes at all or no? I'll let Rebecca take that one. Not from our perspective. No, I mean, not from my perspective. I think like, you know, there's an organization called Lyric Find and I've learned things on panels from them. <laughs> um, but, um, and they actually have been lobbying pretty hard for um, those rights but I don't know too much about that. Okay. Um, well, we've talked about, um, we've talked about licensing. We've talked about, well, obviously the whole conversation has been about licensing. <laughs> um, oh, I have another question. Do we need to send you the songs? Uh, I guess this person's asking about if we need to send the actual songs. The actual song, an actual clip, a recording, sample. No, um, I think a really good way to think about um, our collectives is that we are big data technology companies. So we are um, we are translating what that song is into uh, zeros and ones. Uh, it's all digital information, and it's all codes and the name of the song and the name of the songwriters. And um, yeah, that's like, that's what we're needing to assess how much the actual song is valued at, at the end of the day. So they, so you don't need a digital copy. Okay. That's good to hear. And, and uh, that's good information for those who maybe want to send their stuff in and they want to figure out how to do that properly. That's great. Um, let's just remind everybody that uh, we are uh, talking about uh, rights, royalties, and licensing. And we have Emma Julian from Resound, Rebecca Webster from CMRA, and we have uh, Catherine Jones from Connect. And our topic today is rights, royalties, and licensing. And uh, if you're enjoying this, uh, thank you for tuning in. And let's let other people know just by sharing the experience and let them know. And uh, that'd be great to. I appreciate the fact that you're watching right now. And remember, this goes up onto YouTube uh, at the GMI Hub Online, and you'll be able to see all of our previous uh, library of videos there as well. Excellent. Thank you again, Dale. Well, I'll be honest, 
I'm out of questions. Is there any, I'll, I'll just have this one last one. Um, I know we're ending a little bit early, but I, is there any information that we may not have covered that you feel that singers, songwriters should know about when it comes to music licensing from any of your organization's perspective? I guess I'll jump in here because I, I just feel like it, this hasn't been clarified about um, the difference between performer and master owner for neighboring rights. So um, if you own your own master, you're going to have to do two different registrations uh, in order to get the whole part of your neighboring rights um, from the performer side and the master side. So uh, on the performer side, the organizations that you can register with are Actor Rax, MROC, Artisti, or Resound. And then on the master side, Connect Music, Soproc, or Resound. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify that, get that out there so that people know that they can do a little bit of research. And I think also on um, Catherine's chart that was linked to in the comments, it also um, shows those organizations on the on the performer side as well as um, on the master side as options. Do any of these organizations are all similar to re well okay there's a set that were similar to resound they all do the same they're just different names is that correct? Uh, they don't all do exactly the same thing uh, but they are resounds member organizations. Okay. And um, especially I mean I'll let Catherine speak to the the difference is more on the maker side, but on the performer side, um, the main differences I would say are the international agreements. And so it's really important to um, do some homework and make sure that in the if there is an international market in which you are getting a lot of radio play or you're touring a lot and getting a lot of traction, you wanna make sure that you're well represented in that territory. Um, so, there is some homework to do there for people who are looking to register. Um, and I will say also that for ReSound, there is no term in, ter in terms of if you wanna register today and then with ReSound and then the next day you wanna change your registration to one of the other uh, performer um, organizations, there's no term, you can do that if you want to. Um, but it is important to look at all of them, I would say. And to clarify, if a person is wanting to go international with their music or they're finding that they're writing their music here, but it gets a lot of radio play in Europe, for example, um, to get that recognition, they have, to, they have to register a song with all those organizations that you've listed? No, so they should register with one on the performer side and one on the master owner side. Mm -hmm. And just check, I mean, you can, you can register it depends on your mandates um, and what territories are covered in the mandates, but okay. just one on either side to make sure you're getting that whole neighboring rights uh, royalty that's coming through a different kind of pie. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, I'm seeing, because once you've listed all that, I can just see all their eyes went, oh, I have to write all, what are the names of those organizations? I can register my song with all of those songs. <laughs> that's, no, that's Catherine's kind of chart will clarify. <laughs> yeah. And just, just to give you some context around that, um, for reproduction royalties, every dollar that comes into Connect or comes into CMRA, 100% of that dollar goes to the owner, so the publisher or the, the label. On the public performance um, copyright royalty side, the dollar that goes into SOCAN and the dollar that goes into ReSound are split 50-50. Mm. SOCAN, 50% goes to the writer and 50% goes to the publisher. And on the ReSound side, 50% goes to the maker, as Emma said, or the, the owner, mm -hmm. the, the label, whoever it is, and 50% goes to the performer. How you access that 50% as a performer mm -hmm is, as Emma mentioned, it's either through a performer organization or through ReSound directly. Ah, okay. So it's it's a little cascady. Mm -hmm. I think you just have to consider your situation, like Emma was saying, that um, everyone's situation is different. And, um, and I think the word that we haven't brought up much in this conversation is reciprocals. Um, 
because there's there's agreements with other territories and and the word used in, in rights and royalties is reciprocal agreements so these collectives have made reciprocal agreements with say the uk or turkey to collect and then bring it back to that organization and then pay you um exactly yeah and that's what Emma was talking about with international agreements. You know, Resound has reciprocals with certain territories. Other performer collectives have reciprocals with different territories. So if you're if you are um, um, an artist who predominantly gets play in Germany, you don't want to sign with an organization that has no representation in Germany. Mm. That's mm -hmm. basically it. Very mm. cool. I love how you make it nice and clear and simple for us. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I do have a, uh, more questions are coming. Um, if you license with CD Baby to collect royalties like Apple Music, do they also end up taking a cut of, app, uh, of Apple Live already being collected by Silcan or BMI? Okay, so CD Baby, I can answer that because um, if you, if, so CD Baby is both a, a distributor of music, mm -hmm. so they get your music onto a platform but they if you check the tick box that says cd baby pro or publishing pro. then yeah then 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 you are asking them to collect your publishing um on on your behalf so um in that instance one. cd baby is a client of cmra so in that equation Spotify or Apple will pay CMRA. CMRA will then pay CD Baby. CD Baby will then pay you. Um, sometimes when you're just learning how this all works, it's a good solution because they represent a lot of territories. Um, we call them a publishing administrator because they don't offer um, more services that a full music publisher would offer, like sync licensing. Um, but they do do some of the admin. They get your data all the way into CMRA's um, system so that we can match the recording information to their theirs. But there is, when when we pay them, when we pay CD Baby, there is a percentage taken off at our our payment, and then when they pay you, there is another percentage. So your your question is about. Um, how much you're willing to lose um, in that instance. But if you're not collecting for, if, if there's no one else collecting money in that territory, it might be the right option. You can always choose what territories, mostly. So um, y y look into that as you navigate these platforms. Okay. Um... I'm almost wondering, because uh, earlier in the conversation, we talked about, you know, thinking about uh, music publishers and if, they're, if people don't have an actual music or an organization that's a music publisher, they by default become a self-publisher. Is it almost better to be a self-publisher so they can get a greater cut of what comes in? Or is it better to have, uh, to have the other, you know, an organization take care of that? Well, if you're an, a, a, a human who can handle being a creative human and an administrative human, then maybe it is the right equation. But you might, it's all time and energy because you're having to deal with the relationship with each of the collective organizations and, you know, sending in data and um, any follow-ups, that kind of thing. So um, like anything in life it's 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 a decision based on who you are and what you're able to handle and that's why as people's careers grow and maybe you're touring or you're creating a new virtual environment that you're going to perform in um maybe you don't have time for all that admin and i think everyone on this panel would say make sure that no matter what you're confronted with that you don't leave the money on the table that you have some way of collecting it whether it's you do it yourself, you sign up with a publishing administrator like a CD Baby, like a Song Trust, or you, um, you know, get a publish music publishing deal and they start collecting for you. You know, maybe it's your neighbor who's got time. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, that's great. Ladies, it's been absolutely wonderful having you on. I'm realizing the, the time is gone, but, um, but you're not, you're here. And, you know, I really, 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 really appreciate you taking the time to continue this conversation. And as I'm saying goodbye, all the questions are like, my scrolling is just happening here. <laughs> Um, but I want to say thank you. I don't know if I should ask the questions, Dale. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, um, in, we can uh, forward maybe those questions to you um, if, we, if there are the uh, questions that you think you can answer quickly or. Well, I'm just going to look real quick. I'm just seeing real quick if it can be, uh, if they would be taking 40% or something already getting. I, I guess someone wanted to understand the breakdown again of who gets what. Um, so it was a continuation of the question about CD baby, um, um, getting an apple cut, getting the, the apple, apple live, getting the cut, uh, okay. so can BMI. And then, so if so, would they be taking 40% of something they're already getting? No one's taking 40%. No one's taking 40%. That is, so yeah. they, I don't know where that number came from. Okay. No, I suggest that they read their agreement with CD Baby mm -hmm. um, and then specific to the, the, the split of proceeds. Yeah. yeah. I definitely, the agreement will outline all those uh, percentages for the artists. So. Okay. And every agreement has that. So if you're signing up for any of these collectives, uh, the legal document when you are signing up will tell you what the administration fee is. Yep. And goes from there. Yeah. yeah. I just think it's really important that everybody who is writing and producing um, registers with, uh, with these organizations to make the best benefit from your material for compensation. It's just a wise step forward. Absolutely. And we did have the link go go up in the chat. Um, again, I would I will say thank you, Catherine, for providing that. Please go to that document. It is a resource. It is a resource for you to register to, to walk through the process of why why you register, where you register. It'll hopefully answer all the questions or most of the questions. And if there are questions, um, connect and CEMRA and um, I was going to say, and Emma's company, no, <laughs> and ReSound, um, all have inquiry lines, um, general inquiry lines that they, that you can forward questions to. And I believe, uh, I don't know if it's all of them, but I, I think the last time I spoke to you ladies, um, it was like a 24 hour turnaround time in terms of responding now. Is that correct? 24 to 48 hours for 20, us. Yeah. I just put um, in the chat on the Zoom, maybe yeah. you can take that information, put it on Facebook um, for, for what the inquiry email is with CMRA. Yes. So um, I will so, add ours as well. Great. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we will turn around and Thank also, you. we are going to be putting this on our YouTube channel. So all the information that you're sending us, we will also put in our, in our YouTube. So if you have any questions from CMRA, your e the email address is inquiries, I-N-Q-U-I-R-E-I-E-S at C-M-R-R-A dot C-A. Uh, for connect, it's info at connectmusic dot C-A. Uh, and everyone wants to email Emma directly for ReSound, right? <laughs> it's also info at ReSound dot C-A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will definitely, we will definitely put that down in our, in our, uh, comments later on, but we want to thank not only these ladies, thank you again for taking the time out of your day to, to help us out understanding uh, licensing. This has been, I, I've said it to you privately, I'll say it publicly. Um, this is, to me, the most, one of the most important aspects of the music industry that we need to understand. And I um, and yet it's been a mystery. It's been something that a lot of people didn't understand. I'm hoping and trusting that having these two sessions with you um, has clarified any questions with um, um, our audience. And of course, audience, if you do have more questions, certainly fire them our way. Um, if we can't answer, we're definitely going to send it to the ladies who do know the answer uh, because they're there to be a resource. And 
and I hope that when you listen to these ladies, um, I, I love the term collective. I, I was just rethinking this. Um, these collective organizations are there for you. They're there to, to, to speak on your behalf. They're there to get money so that you can get paid. They're there to do those negotiations for you. So I'm hoping that you all are seeing that and um, well, I guess we'll take advantage of this they, then, and not be afraid to ask any questions related to this because they are an inter integral part of your journey in, to success in the music industry. But I can keep talking. <laughs> but instead, what I will do is I will let everyone go. I'll say good night. We are going to be back next week, Monday. It is Studio Talk Week. So you'll be seeing Daryl and myself um, with some new panelists. So definitely come back next week, 7 p.m., same time, same station. And, uh, and we'll be happy to fill you with more information. And again, bring your questions, bring your friends, share the experience, because we are here to encourage unity, community, mentorship, and talent growth. We'll say good night for now. See you next week. Take care, everyone.